just happens to be wired that way and wants to. Most people are not Don. Most people are not you folks. They live in an economic model that's a free enterprise economy where their fiscal viability is determined by the commodities they sell. So we can either appeal to their better nature and say you've got to treat water and carbon better and wildlife habitat, or we need to induce that behavior by starting to pay for a broader suite of services. And this is going to be, I think, a very challenging conversation where the farmer gets paid not only for his crops, but for the quality and quantity of water in his landscape and the amount of carbon in the soil. This is going to require the arrival of new economic instruments. The same with the meat producer and the same with the logger. Now these conversations have already started in Alberta. We're not inventing them. But they're not implemented, they're not mature, there's not a broad dialogue, it's embryonic. It's going to force agriculture to think about many things. And I don't wish to insult anyone in this room or my heritage. But let's look at the amount of land you're required to produce a unit of something. In the case of forestry, energy, and crops, it's a cubic meter in terms of cows, it's a cubic meter, which is, you think about it, not really that different. We need a lot of land to produce cattle. Not as much to produce crops. Well, guess what? I kind of learned that in high school. But we have agriculture, I think, because it employs so many people, right? Wrong. So here we're looking at the number of jobs per hectare of direct footprint. The energy sector is what's driving employment. Forestry second, agriculture is hardly among them. Well, we must have agriculture because it pays so much royalties into the province of Alberta. Well, it doesn't pay anything. So why do we have agriculture if it consumes all this land, doesn't pay any royalties, and doesn't hire anyone? Here's the amount of land and all land uses in 1905. Four million hectares. Hardly, hardly even see any crop lands. Most of our land was actually in Canada. Here's where we are today. This is direct footprint. More in cropland and grazing lands, but crop and grazing lands are a big one. Forestry is kind of half behind, and you're going to see energy transportation settlements. It's hardly a moment. Let's go to when Alberta celebrates its bicentennial. Our models do not suggest that crop lands will go up much. In fact, they may even go down, and I've already argued why. Forestry footprint will go up, energy sector footprint will go up, transportation will go up, settlements will go up by four times relative to today. So we need to be thinking about the system. I think agriculture is exceptionally important. I'm just not convinced at all the way in which we conduct it today is serving societal needs and nor is sustainable, and certainly not from the standpoint of ecological goods and services. So I talked about the upper bow. It's a very small landscape, not even particularly agriculturally oriented and demonstrated, I hope, in a convincing way that we can manage it much better from the standpoint of agricultural production and ecological goods and services. And if that's the case, you can imagine if we adopted the same principle more broadly across Alberta. So again, how do we see Alberta? How do we see small areas like the Upper Bowl? This is what people see it. They see it. different people have different priorities, but again, most people want well. The land use framework in Alberta is an attempt at a conversation to say Alberta's not getting any bigger or any smaller, but what appeared to be at one point very big now appears to be quite small. It seems to be so darn busy. We need to start making tough decisions. And I hope the, um, our political leadership has what it takes to talk about not trying to do everything everywhere all the time and make some tough decisions about what's going to drive our economy. Because the next several decades, it's probably going to be oil and gas. Are we going to allow our agricultural landscapes and their soils to be lost? because we don't need agricultural production? I would hope not. So where in that landscape do we grow our food, whether it be animal protein or plant protein? Where do we get our high quality water from? Where are we gonna get our wood fiber? Where should people live? Right now the policy in Alberta is to basically fill in the Upton Calvary Corridor. There'll be nine million people by the bicentennial in the Upton Calvary Corridor. Nine million people. The majority of those good agricultural soils will be gone. Policy today requires that to happen. But people have been so busy trying to figure out where do we put all these people, no one's had this strategic conversation. And I think Minister Olson basically 
said that. I'm so busy dealing with the, t the tactical crises of today, I don't have the time to sit with you folks and discuss the strategic level issues. That's sad. So anyway, I hope um, those are a few thoughts to talk about today. I am in no way anti-agriculture. I see agriculture as an unbelievable spectrum, and the way in which you guys talk about it and conduct it is not agriculture. You guys are talking about a land use. You are not reflecting the agricultural spectrum in the province of Alberta. You're having a conversation about an approach that hopefully will be more broadly accepted and understood by your community through time. But um, agriculture is a very broad thing. You guys are here about philosophy. So hopefully that helps. Thanks for the invitation to come chat to you. question that they wanted to bring up here. First hand, got it, and then I'm going to take over the logistics. Just a simple question. This presentation, have you ever given it to MLAs and the cabinet as a group? No. Um, I've had the previous agriculture minister suggested this presentation would be one that would be helpful as a, as a PowerPoint in the legislature. Um, I was kind of hoping that maybe the Minister of Agriculture would be here today to, to hear. Um, there are people that think this kind of message would be helpful. And uh, this is also your presentation today. So it's prepared for you guys. We'll figure out how to, we'll put it up on the web. You can download it, use it however you want, and uh, hopefully get from that story up that way. One more. Um, relatively speaking, Alberta is uh, a young province as far as intensive land use. I suspect uh, if you did this sort of analysis in Europe, Africa, South America, you might see the same sorts of problems. Um, perhaps your comment on uh, like, like, like what you said about Alberta uh, being no bigger, no smaller, that goes for the planet as well. And uh, you know, they're forecasting great surges in, in population growth. It's going to level off. But as we draw down on uh, on the ecological reserves, on the carbon, on the water quality, on the, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to paint uh, an overly pessimistic, futuristic look, but uh, numbers aren't lying, are they? Well, we've had the Elsie's group has been fortunate enough to do work similar to this in Australia, in Africa, where I live. The first models were basically built for Kenya, where I lived for about seven or eight years. We've done some work in Europe. What I find frustrating is Alberta, as you said, is embryonic. We're just babies. You know, the First Nations have been here for a thousand years. We've basically been here for a little bit more than a hundred years. The trajectory that I showed you are trajectories that much of Europe went through two or three hundred years ago. They had the conversations. They encountered these hiccups. Some of those jurisdictions have dealt in a mature way with them, others have not. There is so much opportunity for Alberta to look at space as being a proxy of time and say we don't have to let Alberta unfold for the last next 200 years. We could look at other places that have already been down this road. What did they, what would they teach us? The problem is the severely normal Alberta knows that anything that has happened outside of Alberta has no value. You know, we as a population don't you know, we, it's like we rewrite physical law. You know, if we don't, if we don't invent it, it has no value. And that's sad. There's many other geographies that can teach us a lot. Can you name one part, just like in your state, what, what's that one that teaches? Oh, I could look at um, I could look at programs in Austria, in Netherlands, in Great Britain, where if you look back, what was going on in the 16, 17, 1800s, where people ran out of agricultural land. 
where people, Germany would be an example in force, where uh, very, very intensive forestry practices systematically made systems so simple and so denuded and so sterile in terms of soils that they were, they were required to have a conversation about what level of offtake would essentially balance the rate at which soils are being replenished. Um, again, I'm not sure there's a lot of them that continue to erode their system, but generally humans react when things get really bad. Other places have seen things get really bad, so they've reacted and they, they provide us a dialogue that I think is worth listening to.